Hi everyone, um, I'm Peter, and I'm from the University of Southampton. My supervisor is Poshak Gandhi, and here's a brief list of some other people that I've been um, working with, including the, the new staff AGM team. Um, and I'm here today to talk about obscure supermassive black holes. So just to get on the same page effectively, um, here I'm showing two uh, quite, old, quite old now uh, galaxy images of morpho morphologically very similar galaxies. On the left, I'm showing <coughs> a galaxy that appears to have a very bright source in the very center that's unresolved by this particular optical instrument. And for it to be unresolved and so bright, it's um, a very powerful or a very um, bright power source, which has later been found to be from the accretion onto a supermassive black hole, or the gravitational energy release from a supermassive black hole. So now, my talk is going to focus primarily on two main questions. So how important are obscured AGM? And I'm going to go into what an obscured AGM actually is, what I mean by that. Um, but then in the second part of my talk, I'm going to focus more on how we're going to find these obscured AGM that have potentially been missed in previous surveys. So to start off, just a very basic intrinsics. Um, the, the general schematic for an AGM, or at least the schematic that I'm going to be assuming for a large part of my talk, um, is this, this lovely picture in which we have the, the central supermassive black hole for it to be supermassive. Its uh, mass should be around 10 to the 6 to 10 to the 10 solar masses. Um, it's uh, when enough material comes into the vicinity of the supermassive black hole, it accretes material and forms an accretion disk. Um, the sort of size scale is 1 to 1,000 AU, where an AU is an astronomical unit or about 150 million kilometers. Um, and in terms of just uh, converted to parsecs, uh, it's around one parsec, it's sort of 10 to the 6 AU. Now, the X ray corona is the, uh, uh, the sort of assumed to exist gas of electrons that takes the UV and optical photons that are emitted by the, uh, from the accretion disk and it comps and upscans them. And all that means is it takes the UV um, energies and then it uh, pushes them up to X ray energies and that is your intrinsic X-ray source. Although it's technically a secondary source of the emission, it's taking UV photons and then scattering them into X-ray energies, um, it is, for the purposes of this talk, is the intrinsic X-ray source. And as you can see, it's very, very close to the central supermassive black hole. So then, taking a bit of a, a step out, um, then we have the sort of dust obscuration that's believed to surround these, um, these intrinsic emissions very much in the center here, um, the, the dusty torus, as people have um, dubbed it to be. Uh, it may not be an actual torus shape, is the reason I say that. It's believed to be sort of the radius of 0.1 to 10 parsecs out. And then, because you have this dust obscuring an anisotropic uh, direction on the sky, you then give rise to these ionization cones filled with ionized gas that's being pushed out from the accretion disk, um, and that's around 10 to uh, 10 parsecs to 1 kiloparsec. And then just for completeness on this image, it's not to scale, obviously, but then you, you can get for the most extreme sources radio depth, which can then outshine the entire galaxy on the scale of multiple um, kiloparsecs. So here I'm showing a, a spectrum. So on the x-axis, the uh, photon energy, and then on the y-axis, the intensity of those photons um, of the cosmic X-ray background. So if you point an uh, X-ray facility at any position on the sky, um, this is effectively what you'll see if you're not focusing on a source. This is the, the shape of the background from energies of 1 to 300 keV. That's a very vast um, breadth in energies. Um, and on the, the, the key, I'm just showing the different instruments that have been used to predict the shape of the CXB. Now, this was um, given in part a uh, Nobel Prize in 2002 and was dubbed the, the dawn of X-ray astronomy. This idea that no matter what direction you're pointing out on the sky, you have a source of extra galactic X-ray photons that are always coming into your detector. But what it's later been found to actually be is it's every single AGN X-ray spectrum co-added across every single possible redshift. Um, and it, effectively what's that saying is that um, if you take every single AGN spectrum across cosmic time, the dominant component of the CXB is dominated by every single AGN. So that encompasses every single AGN in every single stage of evolution, 
every single mass of the supermassive black hole. Um, if it's been emitting, emitting X-rays in that energy region, that's what we're seeing. Okay, so what if if we we know what the spectral shape of every single supermassive black hole that's actually accreting looks like? What does one spectrum look like? Here I'm showing an unobscured spectrum. So on the left is the typical schematic um, <coughs> with uh, up-to-date size scales for the sort of the, the gas obscuration. So the gas is the uh, responsible for um, producing the reprocessed spectrum here on the, the right hand side um, and then the purple dashed line is the direct transmitted component from your intrinsic corona shown here the blue is just the accretion disk that I was showing earlier and the black is the supermassive black hole and so it turns out that no matter what obscuration you have you always have some kind of probability that you're going to get a direct transmitted component unscathed <coughs> completely unreprocessed and that's what I'm showing here now, the reason I called it unobscured is because it is still obscured, but you are heavily dominated by the direct transmitted component because the, the obscuration is just not that obscured. Um, it's measured by a column density, which is just the summed up number of particles along a column. And for this sort of column density associated with this spectrum, it's uh, associated with trying to, it's the, sorry, it's the sort of optical depth required to view the sun through a very light cloud, maybe a cirrus cloud, not quite a rain cloud. Um, but then if we take it one step further, there's, it's called Compton Thin because the optical depth to, uh, due to Compton scattering, um, i.e. the sort of likelihood that if you see a scattered photon, it's been Compton scattered, it approaches quite a probable amount and it's the equivalent of trying to view the sun through a rain cloud. Um, as you can see here, the transmitter component has been depleted quite a lot. But the reason it's called Compton Thin is because the transmitted component is still dominating the reprocessed component. So don't you need to calculate the ionization state of the gas self consistently because the opacity depends on that? That's that's very true, but the, the sort of uh, distances from the supermassive black hole is so um, far away or it's far away enough that typically the, the gas state of the reprocessed component is more typical neutral gas. Completely neutral. Yeah, yeah, it is typically but yet you have these electrons. Very powerful electrons. That is very true. Um, yes, but the typical models that, say, the models that I've used to reproduce the plot typically assumes the gas to be neutral. Um, and then just taking it to the extreme level, you have these Compton thick sources where I'm showing quite an extreme case here. You can get sources that still have the transmitted component slightly above um, the reprocessed component, but for the reprocessed dominated Compton thick AGN, um, you see a very dominant uh, reprocessed component, um, very little transmitted component, maybe in the, the hardest X-ray photons, um, sort of beyond 24 keV, and that's equivalent to trying to view the sun through a thunderstorm. Um, or equivalently, it's like trying to point a torch through fog. So okay, um, given the, the spectral shapes of the obscured AGM and an unobscured AGM, why should you care about the obscured AGM? So in the, fir the very first um, answers to this question come from the actual shape of the CFB. So on the left, I'm just showing that same plot that's earlier. So it's the spectral shape of the CFB. And then on the right, I'm showing the general shape of the obscured um, spectrum for an AGM and then the unobscured spectrum for an AGM. <clears throat> and as you can see, it's very, very similar to the obscured AGM spectrum. And this has been used as evidence in the past to say that there is a very dominant contribution um, of AGM to the CFB coming from purely obscured AGM. And it has been found now that the vast majority of AGM um, have con densities in excess of the, the unobscured schematic that I was showing. But it turns out then that the Compton thick fraction is still very unconstrained. And actually, very recently, um, maybe a couple of weeks ago, there has been a new model that has been uh, used to fit the cosmic X-ray background purely from individual populations of AGM. Um, and their results using a neural network to do this have found that within Redshift 1, more than half of all AGM are predicted to be Compton thick, which is quite an interesting result. So what about surveys that are focusing on actually detecting Compton thick AGM? So these are both the essentially the same um, common density <coughs> distribution, just uh, to make it more um, understandable to 
the yeah. actual numbers on the x-axis. These numbers are associated <coughs> to the, the emoji style I was showing earlier. Um, so the observed uh, by this instrument Swiss Band, which is a hard x-ray telescope, um, they have found an observed condensate distribution traced by this dotted line. And as you can see in the Compton Thick bin in the condensate distribution, they find uh, a very relatively low um, fraction of AGM with that condensate, and that is because of uh, a, effectively a bias towards heavily obscured sources. Because it turns out that hard X-ray photons, yes, they have a high penetrating power, but when you get to Compton Thick sources, the optical depth of Compton scattering gets so high that it's still very unlikely that you're going to detect sources that are Compton Thick, and so that's why it's so low. But based on uh, similar spectral models to the ones I was showing, um, you can predict how many sources you should have detected, and so based on model-dependent bias corrections, um, you can then effectively correct your SED, assuming that you know everything prior um, about the SED, <coughs> um, which is where this blue line comes in with the shaded region. And so just to sort of illustrate, um, there's sort of a parameter space that's associated with these bias corrections. I've shaded the entire region um, encompassed by both observed and bias corrected, purely to point out that hard X-ray <coughs> observations are very good at observing Compton thin obscurations and also slightly unobscured um, populations. But in terms of the extremes of the Compton density distribution, they primarily observe quite a large number of unobscured sources, whereas they um, primarily observe a low number of the heavily obscured sources, which you might expect. So that, that survey is within uh, 260 megaparsecs, um, but it's quite interesting just to note that within six megaparsecs, the three nearest AGN to us are heavily obscured. And actually, if you then think about that with these three AGN here, two of those actually turn out to be Compton thick. So within six megaparsecs, um, the Compton thick fraction is actually close to 67%. I know that's only three sources, um, but within 260 megaparsecs already, hard X-ray selection is finding an observed Compton thick fraction of 8%. So something is playing up, and so that's why the Compton thick fraction is very unconstrained. So then, lastly, for this this part of my talk, I was just going to show uh, the the typical or the the way people have fitted the uh, cosmic X-ray background in the past. This is what's known as population synthesis, because you basically say, okay, I know how many um, of particular obscured populations of cosmic AGM make up um, the cosmic X-ray background. I know, or I can predict, how those obscured populations evolve over redshift, and so you can then co-add the different contributions at different um, redshifts to be able to reproduce the spectral trait. And it's very interesting to note that if you purely um, treat unobscured populations of AGM, you get this fit to the data, the dot dash line. If you purely um, use obscured populations, so Compton thin, but you don't consider Compton thick AGM, you get this black line as a fit to the data, but then only when you start to include Compton thick populations do you actually get this red line <coughs> to the data, proving that they are very important to be able to um, fit the maximum peak flux, the cosmic X-ray background at around 30 keV. So, in answer to the, the first question that I posed at the beginning, obscured AGN are the most common form of AGN. Um, the Compton thick fraction, however, is still very unconstrained. 5% um, observed for hard X-ray uh, detection, whereas it ranges to 70% in the very local universe. But they are key to understanding supermassive black hole and galaxy evolution purely from the CXP itself. So that previous graph didn't constrain it more than that? That, that graph doesn't constrain so this Sorry, yes, yeah, so the, that's a good question. Yeah, so the this um, graph used as a prior distribution, this column density distribution from hard X-ray selection, where they um, use bias corrections to be able to predict what the intrinsic column density distribution should be. But those are bias corrections that assume a model that may be incorrect, or may, but it's still something that should be sort of checked. So now on to the second question. How can we find these, these missing Compton thick AGM? Okay. So in terms of selecting AGM sources, you can pretty much choose different uh, sections of your spectral energy distribution. So if you go to the radio, the, the radio observations are typically for radio loud AGM, unless you're talking about core dominated uh, AGM. You are dealing with much larger size scales, there's a 
low optical depth, and so you're less affected by con density um, or high con density sources. And so in that sense, it's isotropic, i.e. it's isotropic of obscuration, and so it's unbiased. But um, at the other end of that spectrum, you have very few radio loud sources. Um, current works predict that it's around 10%. But this, this number of 10%, people don't really know if it's an intrinsic fraction of all AGM at 10% or if it's just uh, another bias that you need to then bias correct. And so this could then potentially implement another bias correction that would have to be implemented. So then what about the optical? So here on the right, it's a bit of a convoluted diagram, but effectively the uh, optical spectra of AGM is a very robust method for determining the, the obscuration class of an AGM. Um, so here, I'm showing that if you have an unobscured view to the accretion disk, you see the Doppler rotation, and so you see the broadening of the emission lines, um, as you can see here in the, the blue, the blue-green spectrum, whereas if you have an obscured line of sight through this that, um, dust and gas obscuration, you see much narrower lines because you're not seeing the rotation of those particles because they're associated with further away from the, the central supermassive black hole. <coughs> Also, this word is polarization, right? Polarized light. Like. Exactly right, yeah. Yeah, as well, yeah. So, the, the idea that um, you see broad lines in the polarized light because that's the, the, the light that isn't effectively direct to the, the incoming source. So, yes, it's a very robust determination, sorry. And I should say that the negative is that it's inefficient because ideally you would have a high resolution optical spectrum of every single um, AGM, but it's very expensive to point a telescope at every single source in the sky. And for the most obscured sources, you do tend to actually get no AGN emission detected in the optical if you have a high covering obscurer. So then in the x-rays, I'm showing this distribution <coughs> again. It's approximately isotropic for the, the middle con densities, um, but for the extremes, it's uh, currently x-ray instruments are not sensitive enough to um, understand this sort of bias by directly observing it. And so that's a potential issue, and it doesn't really solve the issue of this, this bias correction. <coughs> so then finally, we have the mid infrared. So going back to the schematic I was showing earlier, around 0.1 to 10 parsecs is a lot larger than the size scale associated with the very small X-ray emission. And so by that sense, the X-ray obscuration that's associated with these small size scales is not affected by the large scale emission from the dust surrounding the, the AGM that's associated with these larger size scales. And so, in that sense, it is isotropic. But on the other uh, negative side, mid infrared does suffer from star emission contamination, in the sense that the emission you get in the mid infrared can mimic the the uh, can be mimicked, um, but purely from star forming regions as opposed to AGM or active or active. So, this is a plot I made that I was trying to show what I mean by isotropic uh, isotropy in the infrared. Um, so for the dust obscuration, so the dark brown, um, and this, this arrow coming up here, that is giving rise to this entire infrared SED that I'm showing on the right. But it turns out that if you are only considering obscuration from orientation of this obscure, given the intrinsic supermassive black hole system, um, for this shaded region is actually the difference predicted from models in the SED for various different inclinations of the obscura. And beyond sort of 10 microns, it's predicted to be heavily orientation independent. So it is heavily isotropic beyond that, that level in the, the SED. So if we think more about uh, infrared selection um, and the new land survey, which I'm, I'll get onto a little bit in a few slides. Um, here I'm showing in the orange uh, a typical AGM SED, and then in the grey I'm showing a normal host galaxy SED that does not host uh, an AGN, and I've normalised them to 25 microns. Now if we apply a selection <coughs> criteria from the Greif et al, they focused on what's known as a colour selection, which is a spectral shape. So uh, the IRS instrument had photometry points of 25 and 60 microns, and so they focused on the photometry points that would um, be located such that the SED would lie inside this orange region. And as you can see, it really picks out the, the spectral region that is associated with an equivalent AGM if the source is AGM dominated. Now, they then 
applied this to the entire IRS point source catalog um, of flux points on the sky and found a very large number of AGM. Um, but they then classified those in the optical with the, the method I was saying was expensive <coughs> from earlier. It was uh, a large enough sample that they could afford to do the optical follow-up for each of the sources. Now we have taken a volume cut, so just a redshift cut of that sample, and we're going to follow them up with NuSTAR. Now NuSTAR is a hard x-ray instrument, so you might be thinking what would a hard x-ray instrument be able to do, given that I was saying that SwiftBat is biased towards the, uh, against these Compton fixed sources. Well, it turns out that NuSTAR is the only current hard x-ray instrument with enough spectral resolution to resolve Compton fixed AGM um, in critical spectral regions. So here I'm showing the energy coverage of previous soft X-ray instruments, such as Chandra, but also XMM, Swift XRT, <coughs> um, for various different obscurations that are arising because of orientation. So the blue is purely unobscured, where you're seeing down to the intrinsic X-ray corona. Orange, you're seeing through less column than the edge on green here. Um, but then with new stuff, um, you get a spectrum above 3 kV up to 80 kV with much better spectral resolution, and you're able to resolve the critical portion of the Compton fixed spectrum. Because previously you have this very narrow feature for heavily Compton fixed sources that's arising from iron, but with new star in combination with soft X-ray instruments, which is very important as well, you're able to get a much better picture of the spectral energy shape um, for obscured sources and be able to really pin down the the level of obscuration of these most Compton fixed sources. So that's what gave rise to the New Star Local AGM NH Distribution Survey, which is a bit of a mouthful, um, or New Lands. And the idea is that we have taken a volume cut such that there are 84 sources. Um, and of those 84 sources, 54 were detected in the, the back catalog, but 30 of the sources, which were known to host AGM based on infrared and optical diagnostics, um, 30 of them don't have a counterpart detected in hard x ray selection from Swift Bat. And so we have found that that may be because of obscuration, which I will go on to now. So this is a bit of a confusing thing on the x axis, but what, what I'm showing on the x axis is the Swift Bat exposure map signal to noise. So Swift Bat has been surveying the sky for 105 months now, and they have available um, exposure maps of the sky after staring at it for such a long, long time, and the exposure maps tell you how much x-ray flux at any one position on the sky you are actually getting. And if we go to the positions of those 30 sources that are in the in Newlands and extract a signal to noise from them, they, um, well, before I get to that, you can actually predict what the hard x-ray flux should be based on infrared observations. As I said earlier, the infrared is much closer to the intrinsic uh, emission in the infrared, and so you can predict the signal to noise you should be getting if those sources were purely unobscured. And there is even one source that's predicted to have uh, a signal to noise that's higher than 100. But then if you take those sources and you actually go to the positions in the bat maps and extract their signal to noise, they actually have signal to noise below this gray shaded region. Now, this gray shaded region is the approximate um, swift bat detection threshold for the 105 month catalog. <clears throat> and it's showing that all of these sources, pretty much, apart from these ones, um, have signal to noises such that they should not have been detected, which they weren't. So now the current NH distribution uh, in Newlands. So I'm showing the previous shaded NH distribution, or the column density distribution, um, from hard x-ray selection, and then I've overplotted the current Newlands column density distribution with approximately, I think, um, 12, uh, 12 of the, the 30 sources that have been observed in New Land so far. Um, and critically, the Compton thick fraction um, has been found to be consistent with 30%. But from this diagnostic, um, we have been able to um, infer or determine that it's highly indicative that the remaining sources, a large number, may be Compton thick. And so the Compton thick fraction may be higher than um, hard x ray selection has found previously. So then, just wrapping up the, the second question, Newlands is an NH unbiased uh, selection of AGM. 
it's providing an alternative to hard x-ray selection, which can <coughs> complement hard x-ray selection to be able to really constrain the, the true compensate fraction by directly observing it. Um, and critically, the observed compensate fraction is predicted to be higher than uh, hard x-ray selection as found previously. So then just to end on the bigger picture, figuring out how many constants of AGN is essential to sort of complete the picture of um, complete the picture of AGN obscuration because the Compton Pick fraction is very has been very elusive to date. Um, now Compton Thick AGN may be a very important stage in the, the life of growing supermassive black holes or, or of AGN, and that could be a very critical uh, thing to determine based on how prevalent Compton Thick AGN are in the universe. And as a continuation that I hope to do in future work, it'd be very interesting to figure out, okay, how obscured these sources are on average, but where exactly is that obscuration coming from? So on that, I will end. Thank you very much. surface mass density necessary for lensing, mm. gravitational lensing, that's the critical density where you get multiple images. Mm. And it's also the, mean, the, the characteristic surface density of the universe, you have to take the mean density across the entire universe, mm. that's the surface mm. density. Now why is this significant? Because if you had your column of gas, only gas, no dark matter, by itself could lens your quasar if it were halfway. Mm. So if this is not intrinsic absorption, mm. if it's along the path, it could have lensed the quasar, just the gas. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Something to keep in mind. So that could affect the, the cosmic x ray background as well. Yes, but I, you assume that it's all associated with the black hole, so then it's very yeah. close, so it doesn't do much lensing. Right, right. Otherwise, just to keep that in mind. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, so you have these um, the fractions of, uh, of the quasars that you see with different, um, different constant thicknesses. Is, yes. is the, is, is the fraction you see that are very confident thick, is this entirely consistent with what you would expect given orientation effects and some constant covering fraction, or is there uh, is there more to it than that? So, actually, the, uh, this is probably the best one. So, the, as I said, the, the dotted line is the observed one, and then you uh, apply some sort of model to be able to predict the intrinsic fraction. And that predicted intrinsic fraction is taking things into account, such as the just uh, what you would expect purely from orientation effects, um, but also on covering factor dependencies. So I, the, the idea that um, I think this was based on a brighter source is that why more luminous would affect the covering factor, not the Eddington ratio. No, I think yeah. So I think this was um, using the the idea that a more luminous source will have uh, a lower covering factor because it effectively blows out the obscuration, um, and based on that and random orientations on the sky, you can then predict how many you should have, given the, the observed one, and it's using some sort of model. Yeah. Any more questions? Okay, one more. Um, you have some of the very soft sources that have become very hard. Yes. Could you explain that? So it's it's not that the, the soft has become hard, it's more that SwiftBat has detected, um, so just from purely observing the sky, it, it has observed many more unobscured sources, just, just because the, the bright AGN that are unobscured, you're more likely to observe. Oh, okay, so yeah. you just multiply the number down. Yeah, exactly, so that one has gone down, whereas this one has gone up, yeah. And do you actually get a geometry from this distribution? How do you derive the geometry? No, so not derived from it, but I think to get yeah, I'm pretty sure to get the actual predicted intrinsic one, you have to assume some sort of geometry and some sort of dependence on the, on the geometry given the intrinsic luminosity and also the orientation effect as well. Okay, um, as I said, Peter will, will be staying with us uh, for a couple more, day, more days, so it's just free to talk. Uh, more questions, let's thank him again.
speaker today is uh, Chris Fragil. Uh, Chris is professor at the College of Charleston, uh, currently on his sabbatical, so he's traveling around giving nice talks like this one. Uh, and Chris will tell us a little bit about uh, processing this. Uh, so thanks, Monty, for the invitation to be here. So I tried to think of a topic that I could talk about that might be of interest to the diverse audience here and something that I've worked at least a little bit on. So I decided to talk about lens turing precession and applications of it in astrophysics. Um, and I decided to go back and sort of start from uh, the derivation of lens turing precessions. There's a little bit of history and math at the beginning, and then we get to the astrophysics at the end. So, uh, lens during procession, this was derived by Lenz and Zuring in 1918. So they were thinking about a rotating central object. So this was about 47 years before the Kerr metric was um, discovered. So they were using uh, a weak field approximation to what eventually became the Kerr metric. And so it looked like this, and the really only important piece to it uh, is, is that we have an angular momentum for the central object. That's what this S here represents. And then to, to sort of progress, um, what we want to do is linearize the metric. So we're going to rewrite the metric uh, in this linear form, this um, H here. And once you do that, then you can begin to draw parallels between uh, this, this, gravi this general relativistic gravity and electromagnetism. And, and so that's why for a long time I had known, oh, lens during precession, that's a gravitomagnetic torque, but I'd never really thought, what do we mean by gravitomagnetic torque? So the zero, zero, the time, time component of this linearized metric um, is basically analogous to the electric potential from electromagnetism. I mean, it, it's recognizable as the gravitational potential here. Uh, but if you look then, for instance, at the time-space component, uh, so it's basically a vector quantity, and you can write it in terms of the angular momentum vector of the black hole and the position vector, that looks very much like the magnetic vector potential, so the orbit, uh, orbital motion of a charged particle. And you can extend this further because once you have potentials, then you can write down fields, so you can write down something that looks like an electric field, call it a gravito electric field, the gradient of that electric potential and the time derivative of the vector potential, and you can write down a magnetic field as basically a curl of the vector potential. Okay, so all of this now is, is the gravitational equivalent of electromagnetism. At this point, I'm going to go ahead and plug in this expression here for the vector potential, and I'm going to also assume for the rest of the talk that the vector potential is constant. Okay, so these expressions become this. Okay, and so then the next step in electricity and magnetism is to think about what would happen to a charged particle. So you can calculate the equivalent of the Lorentz force, and this is nice to write down because now you can see very clearly that basically your mass has replaced your electric charge. So uh, the particle mass now is replacing the test charge uh, in electricity and magnetism. So you have the force from the electric field and the force from the magnetic field. So just plugging in then the expressions we have for the electric field and the magnetic field, and then dividing out the mass. So this is now written as an acceleration. You have these three terms. Um, that come in, and two of the terms depend explicitly on the rotation of the central object. So now we want to look at what those three terms, what effect they have, and, and of course they only have some interesting effect if the particle has some velocity, so we can consider a couple different um, sample velocities. So the simplest one, if we just think about a particle falling radially towards the central object, so we just put in a radial velocity here. So this term then is going to drop out, and we just have two terms. One's just the acceleration towards the central object. If you're falling towards the black hole, you're going to accelerate as you fall towards it. But there's this other acceleration piece that comes in, and I've plugged in now for the angular momentum of the black hole. I've written it in terms of a spin. 
We have this acceleration in the phi direction. There's going to be some angular acceleration. So there's basically a deflection. Okay. So a particle falling radially towards a rotating black hole, its path is going to be deflected. So this looks a lot like a Coriolis force. In fact, it's usually called the Coriolis force. Uh, being from South Carolina in hurricane territory, we care a lot about the Coriolis force. Um, but this, unlike that Coriolis force, uh, this is a real force, so this is not um, a property of what frame of motion you're, you're considering. This is actually a real force. The particle really is deflected as it approaches the black hole. Now, probably of more interest in astrophysics is to think about a velocity vector for orbital motion, so an azimuthal component to the velocity. And in that case, if you plug that in, then all three um, pieces of the acceleration contribute so you still have the, the radial acceleration towards the central object. The second term now becomes a piece that um, also points uh, basically in the radial direction. Um, and I sort of describe it, it's kind of like a centrifugal force, um, but it can either be a, a plus or a minus sign, depending on whether the orbital motion is in the same direction as the uh, spin of the black hole or in the opposite direction. Uh, but it's acting in the radial direction, so it's either helping support the orbit or taking, uh, you can think, you know, sort of taking away from the orbit. And then the real focus of this talk is the second term here. So this is an acceleration acting in the vertical direction. So this is a particle, well, first off, this term only contributes if there's a tilt, okay? So if theta equals 90 degrees is the symmetry plane of the black hole, so this term's only going to contribute if the particle is out of the symmetry plane of the black hole. So we're in a tilted orbital motion. And then the, the acceleration acts in the vertical direction. And so something in orbital motion with a force acting in the vertical direction is going to undergo precession um, because that's basically acting as a, as a torque on the object. And so that's the source of lens stirring precession. In electromagnetism, there is one more force, which is due to the radiation emitted by the particle in the electrical magnetic fields. That's the reaction. Right. Is it still valid here? Uh, um, Does it emit? So I don't know at what. Uh, so it doesn't come in uh, to this order, but I would presume. I yeah, there has to be. Yeah, there has to be a gravitational radiation equivalent term. Yeah, that presumably comes in. So this is a cartoon illustration of uh, lens stirring precession. So we have a particle that's going to be in a tilted orbit around a rotating black hole. The spin of the black hole is 0.9. Um, the two frames on the left, you're looking, you're in the symmetry plane of the black hole, and the orbit is tilted. And then in this frame, you're looking down on the spin axis of the black hole, and you're going to watch the orbit uh, around the black hole. And so this is just going to show you uh, the lens stirring precession. You can see this orbit uh, precessing uh, by a rather large amount of each orbit, okay? And then it'll sort of rotate to let you get a feel for what that looks like, okay? But this is test particles in convenient orbits very close to the black hole. The goal of the talk is to talk about lens stirring precession in astrophysics. So the first question is, do we have anything like a test particle in astrophysics? And the answer is maybe. Um, we sort of do, in particular stars orbiting supermassive black holes. And the one case that we have some chance of studying is the supermassive black hole at the center of our galaxy and the so-called S stars that orbit around the black hole. So this is a somewhat old movie. Uh, so early data that they discovered, uh, but these are actually stars orbiting around the supermassive black hole at the center of our galaxy, and of particular interest is this star here, uh, which has an orbital period uh, of about 15 years, uh, so that's the star, depending on which group you follow, that's either called S2 or S02. Um, since then, there's a couple more that have been discovered that have similar orbital periods of about 15 years. And the nice thing is, is the three that have been discovered so far uh, have complementary orbits in the sense that they're oriented in different directions. 
and that helps you with some of the systematics of things like exactly where is the supermassive black hole located and exactly what's the mass of the supermassive black hole. All right, so can we use these then to, for instance, look for lens turing precession? Well, not these stars uh, directly. So this plot is sort of indicating um, what's the level of precession that you would expect um, depending on black hole spin parameter. This actually has the three different, so I'm focused mostly on lens turing precession. There's just the Schwarzschild precession or the Sitter precession or apsidal precession, depending on what you want to call it. This was the precession of Mercury. It was one of the first tests of general relativity. Um, that's basically measurable already if we could find stars with an orbital period of about one year. So we're going to need to find some new S stars, or whatever they'll call them after S stars. So some things with slightly shorter orbital periods, a little bit closer to the black hole, but we might be able to measure um, this apsidal precession even at current um, accuracies with adaptive optics. The red curve is the lens turing precession. So for lens turing precession, we're either going to need sort of two orders of magnitude improvement in accuracy, which actually that's about what we're going to get when they start building the 30 meter telescopes that they're starting to construct now. So with a 30 meter telescope with adaptive optics, you can push down to something in this micro arc seconds range that you need. Or if we got lucky and there was a star with a sort of a one month orbital period around Sagittarius A star, you might be able to measure lens during precession with that. Okay. This would be close to the time disruption time. So, uh, yeah, this one doesn't have, yeah, I saw a plot, yeah, you, there's, a, there's a very fine range where you can be outside of tidal disruption but still be able to measure lens during, you're right. So, um, okay, so that's sort of the prospect for directly measuring lens during precession with the equivalent of test particles in astronomy. The other application of lens turing precession that I'm going to talk about is accretion disks. Um, and in particular, remember, lens turing precession requires that the orbits be tilted with respect to the spin axis of the black hole. So we have in mind here tilted accretion disks. So spin axis of the black hole, say, is straight up and down, and the angular momentum of the accretion disk is at some angle with respect to that. So first, to try to motivate this, you say, well, when would you expect the accretion disk to be tilted? I'll give you a couple scenarios where it might be possible. Uh, certainly, I think after uh, galaxy mergers, so here's a merger of two galaxies. Both galaxies probably have a supermassive black hole in their center. Um, the galaxy collision is going to, as you can see, is disrupting all of the gas and dust that was uh, orbiting these two galaxies. So at least for some period, the gas that's going to be feeding and the dust that's going to be feeding the central black hole is going to be reoriented with respect to the spin of that black hole. So you would expect the tilted accretion disk for at least some period after a galaxy merger. Uh, hot topic in astrophysics these days, tidal disruption event. So this is a star in some larger <coughs> orbit around the black hole, gets disrupted, goes on a highly eccentric path uh, past the black hole, gets tidally disrupted. Well, that star, when it started, it's plunged towards the black hole, had no idea what the spin axis of the black hole was going to be. So almost certainly every tidal disruption event is going to have a tilted accretion disk. And I know Ramesh and others are starting to study what happens with tilted accretion disks and tidal disruption. And then even for the more uh, sort of pedantic case of X-ray binaries, we have a black hole and a star in orbit around each other. The accretion disk, which is being fed by the companion star, might be tilted with respect to the spin axis of the black hole if the supernova that created that black hole was slightly asymmetric and was able to sort of reorient things um, before they reformed the X-ray binary. The plot here is a population synthesis study looking at what the probability is of different tilts or misalignment. This study at least suggested that you don't expect very many of them to be tilted. Their argument was 
if the supernova was asymmetric enough to really give you a tilt, it probably is going to disrupt the binary. But anyway, I'll put that up there for that. So these are three scenarios where you might get tilted accretion disks. So then what do you expect to happen if you have a tilted accretion disk? Well, if you ignore internal stresses in the disk and just imagine it as a bunch of, imagine accretion disk as a bunch of particles independently orbiting, then basically all that would happen from lens turing precession is you would just wrap this disk up in sort of a crazy shape. If you imagine grabbing a sheet on a bed and twisting your, your hand around, you'll start winding it up close to your hand faster than you're winding it up further away. And that's what this is kind of um, illustrating here. It just comes from the fact that the lens turing precession is strongly dependent on radius, so the parts close to the black hole are processing much faster than the parts further away, and so things end up winding up. But of course, um, an accretion disk is not just a whole bunch of non-interacting particles. It acts more or less like a fluid. It has something like viscosity holding it together. And actually, in the case where it's strongly coupled, so in hot, thick accretion disks, the coupling is actually strong enough that the lens turing precession is sort of shared across the entire body of the disk, and you actually end up with something more like solid body precession. So this is actually a simulation I did a number of years ago of a tilted accretion disk. You're looking at the disk edge on right now, the spin axis of the black hole is straight up and down, and we basically follow it for one precession period. And the thing to notice, if you can see in the structure of the disk, is it's more or less processing as a solid body. It's not getting wound up or, or disturbed. It more or less looks like a donut the whole time the simulation is going on. Particularly interesting, so observers see this, and they see this thing processing around, and they start imagining, well, what would that look like to my telescope when I'm looking at that accretion disk? And so in particular, because you're sometimes seeing it edge on, and sometimes you're seeing the top of the disk, and sometimes you're seeing the bottom of the disk, that should lead to some sort of a periodic signal in your X-ray light curve, and the period should be tied to this precession period. And so you can actually write down for this solid body precession what that precession period is, and this is the expression. I'll just point out sort of the main factors. It obviously depends on the spin of the black hole. It depends on how big that processing object is. So it depends strongly on the outer radius of it, but also depends on the inner radius. And then it depends on the surface density profile, how you distribute the matter in that accretion disk. So you can write the expression down. You can make a prediction for what the QPO frequencies would be. So I'm saying QPOs, these are quasi-periodic oscillations. So these are um, peaks in the power density spectrum uh, that you would get. So you Fourier transform the light curves, and you see these peaks kind of jump out, and they're called quasi-periodic because they have some width to them. In this case, the width comes from the fact that that processing body is allowed to kind of fluctuate in size, the outer radius can move, the density can shift around, so the precession frequency can change and drift. So it, it has some width to the QPO. Um, in general, in astrophysics, QPOs are interesting because they probably tell us something about accretion physics. In this case, they might be able to be used to tell us something about the spin of the black hole, and then some people like to say it tells us something about, it probes the space-time geometry. I think sometimes that's overselling it. So for the purpose here, I want to focus on one particular type of QPO, what observers have labeled the type C low frequency QPO. And that's the one I think actually matches with lens turing precession of some region of the disk. So the reasons why I think the type C QPO fits as lens turing precession so one, it gives you the right frequency range. So I'll go into this picture a little bit more on the next slide, but what we have in mind here is that some region of the disk is thin and tilted. Inside of that, you have a hot, thick flow, and it's that hot, thick piece that's processing. And so that's the part you care about, the precession frequency of it. So this is one example of one of these X-ray binaries going into outburst. Here's your power density spectrum at the bottom. 
that tall spike there is the QPO, and what you can watch is what happens to the QPO frequency as the burst proceeds. We're at the start of the burst here, or the outburst, and it goes pretty quick. Okay, but what you see, show it again, is right when we first catch this outburst, your frequency is down at a few tenths of a hertz, and then as the outburst progresses, it drifts upward to about 10 hertz and then eventually disappears at about 10 hertz. And so the picture we have is the reason it's doing that. So as the system is going into outburst, we're starting over here in the lower right of this, what's called a hardness intensity diagram. And the geometric picture for what's happening on this side of the diagram is that when we're down here, you have this thin disk that's truncated far out from the black hole with this hot, thick flow inside. And as the outburst proceeds, as the accretion rate goes up, the thin disk is pushing in closer and closer to the black hole. And that means you're squeezing the hot, thick region into a smaller and smaller volume. And that means the precession frequency is going to get higher and higher as the outburst proceeds. And then the idea is once you shift to the soft state, once you turn this corner and come this way, the hot thick flow is basically has disappeared. And that's why the QPO disappears at about 10 hertz or so, is when you make that shift to the other side of this diagram. Another thing that points to the lens stirring precession is the explanation for this type C QPO, is that the type C QPO is stronger in high inclination sources, sources that you're looking more edge on, and it's weaker in the low inclination sources. And you can imagine if you're looking at something that's processing, but you're looking at it more or less face on, that the signals are not gonna change as much as if you're looking at something edge on, where sometimes you're seeing the top, sometimes you're seeing the edge, and sometimes you're seeing the bottom. And then maybe the last bit of work, which is really great work that Adam Ingram has been doing recently, He's been doing something called phase resolved spectroscopy of this iron line, which is essentially a reflection feature. So what I mean by phase resolved spectroscopy, he's been looking at the spectrum and breaking it down by phase of the QPO. And so the picture here is you have this hot, thick inner region processing. And during some phases of precession, that hot, thick region is illuminating this side of the disk that's coming towards you, the blue shifted side of the disk. And so in that case, your reflection feature is going to be slightly blue shifted. And 180 degrees away in phase, you're going to be illuminating the side of the disk that's going away from you, the red shifted side. And so in that case, the iron line is going to be slightly red shifted. Okay? And so this is the one case where he's been able to really pull this out of the data so far. You can see it's sort of a marginal detection with XMM Newton. I'm part of a uh, proposal team for a new NASA mission called Strobex, and this is just sort of an advertisement for uh, the kind of phase resolved spectroscopy we could do if we had an instrument like Strobex. This is the same source that Adam did with XMM Newton, but kind of predicting what you could do with that same source with Strobex. Um, and you see in this case, it would be a very clear distinction between what the iron line looks like in the red phase versus what it looks like in the blue phase. Another nice thing about Strobex is Strobex would be able to look at really bright sources like GX339 that XMM Newton can't look at because of pileup issues. Okay? And so in that case, you just have this blue, beautiful data where the, the error bars become so small they're almost not noticeable. Okay. So hopefully at some point we'll be able to do this even better and really convince people that the type C QPO is an example of lens stirring precession in astrophysics. So I think that was about all I have really time to talk about. A couple other cases where lens stirring precession <coughs> might be important in astrophysics. Um, if the disk is precessing, then there's some possibility that the jet associated with that accretion disk might also precess. So that's an interesting question. I know Ramesh has some students thinking about that too. And then another one, I basically talked about what happens for a thick disk with lens stirring precession. If it's a thin disk, 
there's a prediction, Bardeen and Pedersen, that the inner disk is going to align with the symmetry plane of the black hole, and the outer disk will still be tilted, and so there'll be some warp radius where those two join together. This is, I think, somewhat controversial, uh, certainly in the numerical community, um, and then I think observationally there's not much evidence one way or another on this particular issue. But those are some other applications of lens staring precession in astrophysics. So, thanks for your time. So, I mean, this, this precession, solid body precession, the thick disk, that's beautiful stuff. Now, of course, I've heard this story before. In the real system, you don't just have an isolated horse. It's being fed constantly by this tilted pin disk. So the, what's coming in is always coming with the same orientation of angular momentum from the external supply. Meanwhile, this guy is processing away. Do you have any idea of how that interaction would work and what it would do to this? No, no, and that's my biggest fear in putting this model forward for the Type-C QPO, and that's why I'm doing the simulations that I'm doing right now where we have... So in the past, we've only had the hot, thick flow, and then as, as Ramesh is pointing out, it processes beautifully and it looks wonderful, but in reality, it's being fed by a thin disk, and so we're trying to do a simulation right now where we have a thin disk feeding the hot, thick flow, and we're going to tilt it... And the hope is that it still processes, but the question is, does it still process at the frequency that you predicted for an isolated case? Presumably it won't. It'll change somehow. Or does it, you know, my fear is that it's just going to be held in place by that thin disk and it's not going to process at all, and that'll be a sad day. But I don't know the answer. We're working on it right now, so, yeah. Uh, I'm not sure if you've seen the paper that Avi alluded to uh, of the the, the Sag star, the ISCO from the gravity. No, I uh, I heard so it's something about a, a forty something hour minute forty five minutes period, 45 minute period hot maybe hot spot okay. kind of a thing. Yeah, so I don't know. Is that out? I, I don't know. Forty five minutes. Okay, well let's assume that that's not out yet. Uh, <laughs> but but imagine that uh, people had seen orbits that were face on towards the galactic center. Uh, so that, that would mean a complete misalignment, potentially, for the central black hole's angular momentum. What would that mean for the test you talked we about We don't before? know if it has a spin. Exactly. Well, it might not have a spin, yeah. So, so, but, but if it did have a spin, it might be aligned in, in that way. But we wouldn't have a disk around it. But what would, that, what would that mean for the tests you showed before of the three stars orbiting? Would that be so if the, be able to tell is your question is if the spin was oriented how or so well, was, so how sensitive is that are the tests that you mentioned from the for the stars with the oh, to your orientation of the, of the spin of the um, of the... yeah so the easiest to detect for lens during precession is if you are looking along the axis the spin axis of the black hole and the orbit is more or less in the plane of the sky. That's when you would be able to detect the lens during precession the easiest. If, on the other hand, the spin axis is in the plane of the sky and the orbit is uh, normal to that, you wouldn't even be able to d detect the lens during precession um, I don't, it, by, by measuring orbital motion. So if it's in the plane of the if the spin axis is in the plane of the sky and the orbit's in the plane of the sky, that one would also be able to be difficult to detect because you would have to wait for the precession mm -hmm. to you, mm -hmm. you'd be processing the whole orbital plane and you'd have to wait for that to be noticeable. So, um, so yeah, so the, the ideal case is you're looking along the spin axis and the orbit is is in the plane of the sky, but that probably isn't. So I don't know how optimistic that plot I showed was with the orient with respect to orientation. Yeah. I suspect it was a fairly optimistic view, so it may be even harder. Just looking at your last uh, image here and connecting it to the first talk we heard, uh, so if there is a situation of this type that there is obscuration uh, because of the disk standing in front of the source, Yes, a distant observer, and, and that is a function of time. Wouldn't you expect the 
the, the column density that was described previously could vary in time and, and so perhaps... Uh, so in this case it wouldn't be a function of time on any time scale you could measure because the orientation of the outer disk is fixed. Um, so there's no, in this case there's no precession anymore. Okay, but if there is a precession... If there is a precession then yes you would, but so the the only way you're going to get precession is something on a fairly small scale, so a much smaller scale than where the obscuration that is happening. Makes the orbital period shorter, so that's good. Right. This scenario, though, would lead to some sort of fixed obscuration. So it is possible that if you really had something like this, that this might be playing a role in either, you know, why the winds are being launched or why there's some obscuration from certain angles. So I. I this is really interesting to think if any system really has a configuration like this. Is there any data on time varying NH? Um, so on time varying NH, yeah, there are there are periodic. Sources, yeah, there, were, there are sources that have been found with um, sort of processing or not processing with uh, eclipsing clouds of condensation. Well, that's what you call it, but could it be a, a processing disk? <laughs> but I don't know if it had a given period. So it, 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 <coughs> yeah, it wasn't. It, I don't think it was like a repeating periodic obscuration. So I think there's one or two cases where the obscuration of TDE sources is somewhat right. consistent with the picture that it's a processing something. But they, those papers in the end argued it was other things, but to me it looks like it could be consistent with precession and that that's leading to your obs obscuration changes from the TDE. But Don't mind, Chris, one more question. Sure. You kind of indicated that this is controversial, the body in Petrus. Yes. And I know that people have tried to verify this numerically, so what is the current situation? Well, so this is a numerical simulation. This is what the SPH, SPH I yes. remember, yes. 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 Yeah. And the people who have tried to do this with um, uh, Eulerian MHD codes, uh, we, our group, we didn't find any alignment for the prograde case. Um, Sasha Chukovsko and Matthew Liska just posted a paper on the archive, I think, where they saw some evidence for alignment, but at very small radius, like uh, four GM over C squared or something, and it was only a partial alignment. And so the Eulerian MHD are getting little to no alignment effect, whereas SPH gets these beautiful alignments out to large radii and things. So that's what I mean. There's, there's definitely a discrepancy. Yeah, I mean, you can understand why SPH would get it. It's much more dissipative. It's got extra viscosity, right? But if I remember the theory, it's all supposed to depend on the thickness, right? H over R versus alpha. Or yes, that's the idea. Uh, and you guys are in the regime where it's supposed to work? So, for sure, um, so we were approaching, we were kind of in the, uh, we were in the, H over R was similar to alpha, and you're supposed to be in the H over R less than alpha. Uh, I think Sasha Tchaikovsky is they went even thinner than we did, um, and they didn't see much alignment, so. Are there any more questions? Right, I'll, I'll myself to ask the, the last one. So yeah. this is uh, uh, body in Peterson is a uh, hydrodynamical effect. It's, uh, or does it require a magnetic field or anything? Well, like they assumed an alpha. So they assumed a viscosity that's probably viscosity. really coming from MHD turbulence or something. But what would be the, uh, the time scale predicted for that? Uh, for, for the alignment with body in Peterson? So, okay, um, if, you mean, if you mean the formation of this inner disk aligned, outer disk tilted, that happens on um, basically the viscous time scale from whatever radius this is, so it's fairly short. Eventually though, so there's still a torque going on here because the black hole's still exerting a torque on new material coming in from here and having to align which means that the disk is also exerting a torque on the black hole, you know, the, the equal and opposite. So eventually the whole system is expected to realign itself to be an aligned system. Pro progressing alignment with some viscosity. Yeah, that time scale is, is 
longer. So for AGN, they probably spend most of their lifetime aligned because they have enough time. For X-ray binaries, the alignment time scale is basically the lifetime of the X-ray binary. So if they are tilted, they will probably be or tilted TDs, for their whole. Like and TDEs, you don't expect. Um, yeah. Great. Right. Uh, so let's uh, thank the speaker again. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. My pleasure. <laughs> really enjoyed it.